Oh, good morning, good morning. How are you? Oh, I think the old, uh, the hot spell has finally come to an end. It's going to be muggy today. Which basically is a weird way of saying humid, isn't it? Let's just get myself on the road. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday's a busy day for me. Hygienist comes in on Tuesday. <clears throat> so. Surgery's heaving, heaving with patients. And we had only had three or four patients yesterday, so we all went home early, which was nice. Today's a busy day. <clears throat> bit of a problem that the hygienist only comes in on a Tuesday so you know you get someone in you say you want to come and see the hygienist and they say yeah but my day off is like I can get Mondays off and Fridays off but I work Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and we we're like oh well, that's a shame because the hygienist only works Tuesday then they treat it like you know like you should have a hygienist available to any single any any day but you don't I mean you know you're not you're not under any obligation provide a hygienist for them on a day that they can come, the only day that they can come in, any more than they're under an obligation to come in on the only day that you've got a hygienist, so I mean, it makes good business sense to be as flexible as possible, but to be honest with you, um, we don't have enough uh, patience for a full-time hygienist, and so, um, you know, we have to decide what day she's going to come in, and if they, you know, if they want to see a hygienist, then they have to come in that day. People still have a lot of trouble uh, getting time off work, you know, it's, uh, it's, it wasn't so much of a problem in the 80s and 90s and then all of a sudden it became a big problem and people were like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't take any time off work for dental appointments and we used to say to them, look, a dental appointment is a medical appointment, you know, your, your firm can't discriminate against you because, or take, uh, insist that you take it out of your holiday because it's a medical appointment, you are entitled to have time off for medical reasons, and <laughs> they're like, yeah, but it's a checkup, you know, and the firm gets funny. Whether they're, you know, and they didn't feel able to enforce their, their sort of so-called right to take time off for dentistry. So the old, you know, I've got, a, I'm having the afternoon off, I've got a dental appointment, uh, went out really, when, when I came in in the 80s, that was a sort of the last of that. Nowadays, um, you know, you get people, <laughs> you know, you say you wanted like a hygienist appointment and they'll be like, well, um, I have got some holiday owing. And you think, oh, that's a bit disappointing, isn't it? It's a shame that they've had to take like a half day holiday or something for a hygienist appointment. So we, we do our best. We try to be as flexible as we can. Anyway, what do you think about that old Theresa May then? <laughs> Is she, is she not the most effing useless prime minister stroke politician we've ever had? Is she? I mean, you know, and she's in good company. I mean, she's up there with uh, John Major and oh, all the others, the Gordon Browns. She's out doing them all, isn't she? She had a reasonably good majority, decided to campaign for an increased majority to give her a better negotiating position, then decided to come up with a manifesto on a load of other issues that she didn't even need to mention. She could have gone to the party with just a one question, please give me a massive majority for Brexit. And she would have got it, because even, I'll tell you why, because everybody who voted for Brexit would have voted Tory, and everybody who voted to remain would have voted for a large majority because they believe that it's in the country's interest having decided to leave to get the best possible deal. That's all she had to do. She had one job. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to complain about that because she surpassed herself with an even greater degree of ridiculousness yesterday when she decided to bribe, right, let's not mince words, decided to bribe the Democratic Unionist Party, or whatever they're called, with with over a billion pounds. This is like 180 pounds, it's about 
177 pounds for every person in Northern Ireland. And uh, it's for what, seven votes? I mean, I'm speechless, I am speechless. This just shows you what they are, you know, politicians are like. They are, they're just a bunch of rats feeding off our tax revenues, <laughs> gnawing each other's legs off to stay at the top of the pile to maintain their privilege, you know, their, their uh, <clears throat> rich and shameless lifestyle. She's got something like seven votes, now she's got a majority of 13. She's bought seven votes and she's bought them at uh, 200 million pounds per MP. That's basically what it costs. Just over 200 million pounds per, plus with more to come, you know. <clears throat> not That's not the end of it. This is just like a, a temporary arrangement, see how it goes. And then that means she can do things like get the budgets through and defeat votes of no confidence. It's a shameless attempt just to stay, to stay in power by our fingernails using taxpayers' money. And that's what it is. I mean, it's basically the people in Northern Ireland get more money from the Exchequer than any other region. They get, we, we in the South get about £10,000 a head back out of our own money. And in Northern Ireland, they already get about £14,000 a head which they would argue is back out of their own money, except that they pay less than us in the first place, and they get more back. So they're already the most privileged people in the union, and now they're getting another one, you know, another few, a few hundred quid just to vote, to swallow their principles, <laughs> to sort of pretend that they're not homophobic, and to pretend that they're not uh, misogynistic. <laughs> Just swallow, swallow your principles. I tell you, for 200 million quid, I'd probably swallow my principles as well. So you can't blame them. <coughs> oh dear. What can you, I mean, my, I voted Brexit, but, and everyone assumes when you, if you voted Brexit, it's because you did it because they're foreigners. No, but actually I didn't. I like foreigners. I qualified at University College in London and we had a lot of um, people who came there from all over the world. You know, I had friends from Japan, I had friends from Nigeria, I had friends from Turkey. And I really, you know, I really believe this. You know, you have to look past the colour of people's skin to see what sort of person they are. You know, I've, I've met some right arseholes as well. And believe me, <clears throat> your, your qualities and your personality and what the essential, the quintessential you is not embodied in your skin colour. So I'm not really even looking at that. But my uh, reason why I voted against was um, the size of government. I don't like big government and this was just big government gone mad. My ideal size of government is so tiny that you can hardly see it. <laughs> and we don't have that. And we don't... Uh, uh, you know, we, we certainly don't have it in dentistry. The influence of government into uh, the dental sphere has, you know, has expanded. Um, and I did a radio interview on Sunday where I explained to um, the listeners that in 1948 the government bought out the doctors. They literally nationalised them. They bought, they paid them for their surgeries, and they put them on a salary. And they said they paid for their staff and their materials and everything, they became like a government salaried service. But they didn't do that to the dentists. You know, I think, possibly, um, they didn't want to do it because it was it would have been far more expensive because the dentists at the time were, <clears throat> in terms of um, running the service, was was probably a more expensive service to run. Bearing in mind that we're, we're just talking about in general practice now. I mean, in those days, you do all your doctor had was a table, a chair, and a stethoscope, and a sphygmomanometer. Um, Old doctor, uh, my doctor, well, forget what he's known, Dr. Nichols in Ashford, Middlesex. <clears throat> That's all he had. And then uh, in his later life, he got a soldering iron to burn off warts. Well, that was a bit of a high tech kit, you know, really? <laughs> oh, oh, yes, I remember. Many a happy hour spent sitting there listening to my, smelling my flesh burn watching the smoke come up but anyway uh, I digress so where was I oh yeah 
how useless Theresa May is and uh, central government, the size of central government. So micromanagement doesn't work. And that's what all the government does. They sort of, they're, uh, you know, they elected the empire building micromanagement approach they've got. They, they didn't work. The Care Quality Commission was set up to oversee standards and, you know, uh, represent the patients in terms of quality. And what do we get? We get the Demelza case where one of the surgeries that they're, they're completely happy with. And as I've said in the past, John Milne, who's in charge, always said, you know, the purpose of the CQC was really to ask one question, would he be happy to send his mother there? And he would have been happy to have sent his mother to see Demelza. And yet it was the largest recall of NHS patients in history, something like 22,000 patients. And what did they find? Nothing. Because it's, uh, you know, it was it was just a, it was a storm in a teacup, the whole thing. Not that I'm saying you shouldn't have cross-infection control. I'm just saying that there's ways and there's ways. And I qualified in 1981 and we had cross-infection control. We went through the whole bloody AIDS thing and everyone was fine. Do you know what I mean? We didn't have we didn't have to spend the money that we do now. And what, what happens is money just gets passed on to the patients, doesn't it? Patients are all complaining that there's no NHS dentists. And dentists are getting paid a flat rate fee, 25 quid for this, 75 quid for that. 75 quid for a course of treatment that includes as many you know, check-up x-rays as scale and polish as many fillings as you like as many root treatments as you like as many extractions as you like you know smoking cessation advice <laughs> hygienist visits 75 quid flat rate oh yeah that's very doable isn't it yeah that's very doable everything the government touch touches turns to shit and your you know I've just picked up the times right you're you're like oh Trenchon as one one the bloke who was the chairman of the House of Commons Select Committee called Doug something else Doug oh, Twit I think his name was and uh, he had a white beard or something and after I gave evidence to the House of Commons Select Committee he came up to me and he says Trenchant, he says, Trenchant, that was his only word, Trenchant, by which he means immoderate, I'm going to ignore you because you're an extremist, you know. They don't like, uh, too far, too far from the established, accepted centre of the collective consciousness, that's what he's saying. You're trying to pull us too far away, you know. Centimetre, yes. An inch, possibly. Half a fucking mile. No! <laughs> Trenchant. <laughs> you're, if you want to see this, right, you're saying, angry, you're too trenchant. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, fine, I am trenchant. I don't mind being called trenchant. I like being trenchant. That's it. I think a few more people, but more trenchant people would be fine. <laughs> but you read the Times today, okay? An NHS contractor right by which I don't mean a self-employed subcontractor I mean like a, just an NHS someone who's been asked to do a job on behalf of the NHS has been found by the audit National Audit Office to have disposed of not lost right? <laughs> not sort of not left on a train or something like they normally do no literally disposed of shredded burnt hid under the mattress <laughs> swept under the carpet 700,000 letters of patients correspondence and this is not a job that they were given and that they thought they said oh they thought this was just filing but it wasn't just filing it was letters from GPs to you know about patients their job was to um, distribute it to uh, make sure that it all got actioned and went to the right people found its right destination and it more was coming in every day, so it's not like they knew it, they knew it wasn't filing. This is all current correspondence. So what did they do? Obviously, they horrendously under-resourced this because, the, you know, the first thing they pay is themselves, and then the second thing they do is think about getting the job done, and paying the staff, and this involves 170,000 patients. I mean, you have to ask yourself how 700,000 letters got generated about 170,000 patients because that is. That's a lot, isn't it? That's about, that's at least uh, four or five letters per patient. But 
the funniest thing I think was that when when something like this turns up it's 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 like a race to sit down to cover your butt <laughs> to make sure your butt is covered and so the National Audit Office is you know has done this report and that covers their butt because they've exposed it all and they don't want to be accused of covering anything up so that's fine but they're working against the interests of everybody who's who was involved in this negligence and so the race is then on to um, prevent any money leaking because if you're involved in this whether you're part of the people who commission them or the people who carried it out you're worried about being taken to court for negligence, found to negligence. And negligence, you have to prove that a loss occurred. Some damage has occurred, and that damage caused you a loss. And that's and so the court says, well, you have suffered a loss, Mr. Watson. Five of your letters got lost, and as a result, you died. And so, <laughs> but it's not a financial loss. You can't actually sue for that. But supposing there was a financial loss. Well, obviously the race is on then, isn't it? to make sure that um, no one can prove a financial loss. So what happened is that uh, uh, their response to this, this, <laughs> this overwhelmingly <laughs> demonstrative report that everything the government touches turns to shit <laughs> and that they are not above hiding 700,000 pieces of correspondence in a room marked clinical notes and then shredding them sending them off to like a secure i assume they did either that or they just put them all in a dustbin and sprinkled them all with uh, with uh, uh some sort of uh turned them into compost i don't know <laughs> i'm assuming they shredded them perhaps they didn't perhaps that's how the national audit office found them come on no it's not gonna go okay but but if you wanted any evidence that small government is the only way to go, then these stories are cropping up all the time, you know? This is <coughs> even, we noticed I've not even mentioned the Grenfell Tower. And the fact that, you know, now, now we've had a tragedy. Now we've had an unspeakable tragedy. Children being burned alive by the dozen. And they've now decided that they're now going to sort of have a look and see where corners may have been cut where fire doors may have been not replaced you know hundreds of fire doors missing hundreds of sprinkler systems missing uh, th thousands of panels combustible panels stuck on the side of tower blocks oh yeah perhaps we better have a look at that now you know now let's 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 but it's all going to get you know it's like oh well the government is seen as stepping in you know the government is the government we need more uh, the government the local council should do something the local council did do something they burned everybody to fucking death that's what the local council did sorry it's an emotional subject but they won more of the same. They want the people who made the mistake to fix the mistake without thinking about whether the people who made the mistake should be even be in charge of a children's tea party in future. You know, they're not, the answer is not more regulations, it's not more inquiries. Every single inquiry I've ever uh, followed up night and this includes the dental inquiries every single inquiry the results have been ignored every single tragedy that we have you'll you'll if you trace it back you'll find that what went wrong was the subject of a recommendation not not you know an unenforceable recommendation that was ignored by government from a previous inquiry so it's not we have a governance problem in this country. We honestly, we do. I'm not saying we have a problem with democracy. I, I have no problem at all with democracy. But democracy is not a substitute for a meritocracy. You know, this. You look at this Camden Council and the girl who, who's in charge of Camden Council, and I can't be alone in thinking that she looks like a child. You know, 
she's like <laughs> she's probably only in her twenties. If she's not, she's she's uh, she's doing very well. But it turns out she's the daughter of a famous politician, and the the daughter of an you know of a, a mother and a father who are you know are high up in government. And I can't help thinking that this is not a meritocracy, you know. I don't think, I mean, she may argue that she got there on her own merits. But I just don't, I find that that's not my starting point. Let's put it this way. My starting point is that she probably didn't. She probably got there through family connections. And uh, while it's not her fault, and, and she's quite right that she's only been in the office, you know, in office for a few for a few months and therefore can hardly be held accountable for um, you know the the uh, all the planning that was put on years ago I don't you know she typifies it for me she she typifies the sort of the fact that it's not a meritocracy and that people can skip responsibility for the things the really really serious mistakes that they make by just sort of skipping and saying oh well we're going to have a public inquiry over that. Nothing's been decided. I can't comment on that. You know, I've been advised not to comment. But while the whole thing's under investigation, things aren't done that way anymore. We've had a look and we've changed our procedures. And, and by the way, all the people who did that have now moved on. Um, we don't know. We're not going to tell you who they are. And we don't, we're not going to tell you where they've gone. You know, I'm very depressed. I'm depressed and angry this morning. Sorry I shouted at you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go and see what idiocy awaits me in the surgery. I'll suggest you to too. All right, bye.